I quite like sleeper cars. Did Alex ever tell you the story of what we got up to in Colorado? There was this sleeper car competition, you see. Let's just say no one was ready for the sunbeam. Lotus never quite let go of the upgrade game. So in addition to building their own supercars, they upgraded cars from other marks too. The Lotus Carlton was one such aftermarket upgrade. Lotus took a respectable four-door Vauxhall saloon and turned it into a supercar. From the outside, there are a few signs that this is something special. Wider wheel arches, that sort of thing. But under the bonnet, that's where the magic starts. Engine capacity was increased to 3.6 litres and twin Garrett T25 turbochargers were added. The engine block was reinforced and new crankshafts were forged by Opel and machined in Germany. The tyres were widened and the tyre compound from the Lotus Esprit was used. To handle camber change issues, they put in the self-leveling suspension from the Opel Senator. The only upgrade they didn't put in was an electronic speed limiter. All of this resulted in the Lotus Carlton, designated Type 104 by Lotus. A 177 miles per hour supercar, masquerading as a four-door saloon. Only 950 of these custom gems were built, and they've become something of a modern classic. The Lotus Carlton was an example of how to turn a saloon into a supercar, but that's not the only thing Lotus got up to. In 1979, Chrysler approached Lotus to create a strict rally version of their Sunbeam three-door hatchback. Lotus, as you might imagine, rather enjoyed the challenge. They took the rear-wheel drive hatchback and changed everything that matters. They stiffened the suspension, improved the anti-roll bars and widened the transmission tunnel. was increased by fitting a 2.2 litre version of the Lotus 911 slant four-cylinder engine, resulting in an impressive 250 brake horsepower, up from a meagre 105 on the original. The Lotus Sunbeam was revealed to the public in 1979 in Geneva to widespread praise in the motoring media. the Lotus Sunbeam saw racing success too. In 1980, Henri Toibinen won the 29th Lombard RAC Rally in his Sunbeam. wonder if Lotus should do more conversion. It's a silly question actually. Lotus should do more conversions. In fact, I'll call them right now.
I honestly think these might be some of the most beautiful cars in the world. And the story of how it came about is, well, really British. Get in the car and let's get this segment. Jaguar is a bit of a favourite of mine. The company is almost a hundred years old and was originally founded to build sidecars for motorcycles. But this is the car that really set the bar, I think. The 1961 E-Type. When he saw it, Enzo Ferrari called it the most beautiful car in the world. High praise indeed. He wasn't alone in his admiration. Accolades have followed this car ever since. It's been in movies, comics, games and TV shows. Unlike some later cars in the mark, it wasn't just looks though. The E-Type was light and fast. It would do 153 miles an hour and stopped on innovative four-wheel brakes that were better than anything Ferrari or Porsche or even Mercedes-Benz had. It was solid too, with a design based on the D-Type that won the 24 Hours of Le Mans three years in a row. Anyone who owns an E-Type will tell you that the key to their reliability is to drive them regularly, as if you'd need the excuse. About two and a half thousand were built, and they're a common sight at auto shows, and surprisingly reasonably priced. All in all, an almost perfect Jaguar. The E-Type was the successor to the Le Mans winning D-Type, but what would that look like if Jaguar designed it today? In 2013, Jaguar answered that question with the F-Type Project 7, a spiritual successor to the E-Type, and designed from the ground up to be the purest, most enjoyable Jaguar yet. The car's heritage is proudly displayed in the gorgeous D-type curves and the distinctive aero hunch behind the driving position. But like the E-type, it's not just a pretty face. Powered by a 5-litre V8 supercharged engine, with a fully aluminium body, it's blisteringly fast. With a 0-60 speed of 3.8 seconds and a top speed of 186 miles an hour. A car as beautiful as this must surely have been a carefully authored design. Actually, it started as a sketch by designer Cesar Pieri, thrown together one Friday in his free time. Jaguar's design director, Ian Callum, saw the sketch in a thumbnail on Cesar's computer during a meeting and asked him what it was. The rest is history. <laughs> 250 Project 7s were built as both a successor to the E-Type and as a celebration of Jaguar's victories at Le Mans. I think I speak for all of us when I say, thank heavens for Cesar's Friday afternoon doodle. We're almost done, but we saved the good stuff for last. A spot of rallying in the most British car of them all. Get in, strap in, and let's nail this one.
There is one car built in Great Britain that is quite fairly considered one of the most influential cars of the century. It's a surprisingly spacious little city car with a side-mounted engine. It's an icon of popular culture. It's been built on every continent where there's a car factory. It's the Mini. The Mini Cooper S was built to be a performance machine with deeper engines, twin carburettors and front disc brakes, this scrappy little machine would go on to achieve more than 30 racing victories in the 1960s and 1970s. A Mini Cooper S flying number 37 placed first at the 1964 Monte Carlo Rally. Driven by Paddy Hopkirk and Henry Lydon, this was the last time an all-British crew would win the event. But not the last time a Mini would. At Monte Carlo in 1966, Minis took the first, second and third positions. They were all disqualified because they had dimming headlamps. Not because they were winning everything in sight. In 1999, the Car of the Century Award was presented to the most influential car of the 20th century. The Mini came second. It was beaten by the Model T Ford. That's fair, I suppose. 5.3 million Minis would be sold, making it the most popular British car. And then in 2000, BMW resumed production of the Mini, breathing new life into the iconic mark. If the Mini of the 1960s had its sights set on the roads of Monte Carlo, the X-rayed Countryman has its eyes on something a little tougher. The deserts and rough terrain of the Dakar for starters. A wit once said that the only thing Mini in this monster was the pedal. That's rather missing the point, I think. The X-rayed Countryman is much, much bigger than the Mini Cooper. It has to be. A stage of the Dakar demands literally tons of gear. You could call it a tank. It does rather sound like one. X-Raid division set out to build this thing, they had one goal in mind, winning the Dakar. And they did, every year, from 2012 to 2015. It's designed to be driven for two weeks over deserts and badlands, five kilometers above sea level, and it still handles like a hot hatch on a nice bit of dry airstream. Owners come and go. The heritage of a car like the Mini is more than who owns the keys to the shop. I fully expect to see Mini's wings flying for another century. This is quite the story. Bentley at Le Mans in the 1930s. Gentlemen races and heroic driving. A personal hero of mine. Take good care of the cars though. Both of them belong to me. Bentley, a company founded in 1919 in Cricklewood, North London, and purchased by Rolls-Royce in the 30s a company synonymous with both racing and luxury. Perhaps the best example I know of those two extremes of British engineering. For almost a century, every Bentley was hand-built to exacting standards. So at the beginning of the 21st century, when Bentley revealed their first mass-produced car, there were a great many questions. The car was the Continental GT, an elegant grand tourer that combined a racetrack pedigree 
with exquisite style and all the power you could need. The move to mass production has done nothing to blunt the Bentley experience. The 2017 Continental Supersport is responsive, fast and beautifully designed. brings together all-wheel drive, carbon fibre bonnet sides and side skirts to create the most powerful performance focused car the company has ever built. But never forget, Bentley's pedigree is racing and the Bentley Continental embraces that. In 2007, a largely standard Continental Speed GT broke Bugatti's record for the flying kilometre on the frozen Baltic Sea. And then in 2011, they broke their own record. 205 miles an hour, both ways, on ice. Even when building these gorgeous Grand Tours, Bentley is driven to excellence. Today, Bentley means modern, peerless luxury and elegance, but that's far from the full story. A century ago, Bentley meant something else entirely. It meant Le Mans. In 1930, eccentric race team owner Dorothy Paget financed a rather special Bentley at the Le Mans. It was a 4.5 litre supercharged masterpiece, driven by Sir Henry Bentley boy Birkin. It posted the fastest time on the day, but it failed to finish. But what a race it was. Sir Henry's courageous driving forced Rudolf Caracciola's seven litre Mercedes out of the race at the cost of his own victory. But in doing so, he ensured that the Bentley Sixes would take the victory. Sir Henry knew he didn't have anything to prove. In 1929, the adventurer Mrs. Mary Victor Bruce had already driven the resolutely modern 4.5 litre Bentley at Montlaï, setting distance, speed and endurance records. The Bentley's performance so annoyed Ettore Bugatti that he called it the world's fastest lorry. Oh, and when the blower finally went on auction in 2012, it fetched more than enough to get yourself a Veyron and a racing truck. Like I told them, can't make a film about car culture around here without you in it, can they? I'll let you know if they need you back.